Welcome to a new wave of entrepreneurship. I'm Scott Sturt, founder and CEO of Venture for Canada and your host. The focus of this podcast is to hear from change makers and young Canadian entrepreneurs to learn how they develop their entrepreneurial mindset and skills. In season one, we'll be chatting with young Canadians about their entrepreneurial journey as Venture for Canada fellow alumni. I'm excited to dive into these conversations about how to foster your entrepreneurial mindset and drive. We are super excited to have Josh McIntyre, who is the Director of Revenue Operations at Grammarly, uh, which provides a tool used today by over 30 million people to strengthen their writing and to help people say what they really mean. Previously, he was the lead of special projects at Presley, uh, a Toronto-based uh, startup that was acquired by Vision Critical, and he is a 2015 Venture for Canada Fellow. He is also a member of the Board of Directors at Venture for Canada. We're super excited to have Josh on a new wave of entrepreneurship. Josh, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Scott. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. We're really excited to have you on. Uh, so for, first kind of question uh, for you, Josh, is can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Yeah, yeah, sure thing. So I think you covered the, the high level when it comes to what I do for work. I'm originally from Nova Scotia, out east, same as yourself, from Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, lived there from about age seven all the way up until, until college and then went to undergrad um, at St. Avex University and then eventually went back to business school at St. Mary's University and did my MBA there. Um, so I lived in Toronto for a while working at Presley and also Canadian Tire Corporate before that. Um, and then made the move down to San Francisco in 2017 to work at Grammarly. I lived there for about two and a half years and more recently moved up to Vancouver where I am now um, today where I uh, opened up the new office that we have here along with two of our co-founders and I've been here for about a year. So I've been at Grammarly three and a half years, give or take a month or so. One of the things that uh, I found kind of interesting is that you're uh, a, uh, a very successful former varsity uh, athlete and uh, you uh, played at soccer at a very uh, competitive uh, level. And one of the things that I've observed with Venture for Canada is that there's actually a lot of uh, former uh, uh, very high level athletes that are participating in Venture for Canada. It seems also a lot of uh, successful entrepreneurs come from these very competitive athletic uh, backgrounds. So my first question uh, kind of for you is what, uh, what are some lessons that you learned from playing soccer at uh, an elite level and, and how do you think it applies to a startup or entre uh, entrepreneurial uh, environment? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And I'm, I'm trying to think of an analogy or an answer that doesn't sound too cliche or like a sports cliche, but just so much, right? Like the, the obvious stuff that you think about is teamwork um, and like buying into a vision or buying into a team goal, which obviously translates to kind of any team-based or collaborative environment that you're in. I'd say the other major aspect is time management, like playing varsity soccer in undergrad, your commitment during the season, about 25 to 30 hours a week on top of having a full course load. Um, and with Canada being a little bit different than the States, the student athlete, there's much more of an emphasis on the student side than the athlete part. It's not like your whole life is paid for, they move around your schedules. Um, so that prioritization is a huge plus now that uh, working full time and obviously having a social life and, and different commitments, like working with Bench for Canada outside of work, it really helps me in that regard. And I'd say um, the biggest thing that, that's been brought over is like the, the satisfaction that you get from like really suffering for a goal. Suffering is obviously an intense word, but um, sitting at a desk and working on something for, for hours to get it done or to move the team forward feels a lot easier than um, spending a ton of time in the weight room or getting beat around on the soccer field. Uh, the physical side of things definitely makes me appreciate what my life is like now for sure. I one of my roommates in university was a varsity um, uh, athlete. Uh, he did uh, track and field and he gave me so much more an appreciation uh, seeing his sleep schedule and spending 30, 40 hours a week uh, training on top of all courses. I, I don't think I, I ever really appreciated uh, the uh, sacrifices and dedication of varsity athletes until actually living with one and sharing a room. <laughs> it, it's pretty intense from, and, and it teaches somebody a lot about time management, I, I can imagine. Yeah, definitely. And it's ironic you bring up track or cross country because the, the teams at X are pretty elite. Like they're coached by a former Olympian and they used to wear these t-shirts um, that they wore around that says like, our sport is your sports punishment, which is a pretty, pretty funny way, right? It's a, it's a pretty, pretty heavy sport to be in. It's pretty taxing on the body. Um, yeah, time management's been huge uh, when it comes to it, right? Especially because when you're a varsity athlete, um, you're not just 
managing time is if you have a lot of commitments, you're also managing time when you're extremely tired. You can be both mentally, physically, and also emotionally spent depending on what's happening, right? If you're having a great week of practice or you have a big game and you end up losing, like all those things kind of affect you in a normal way because everybody's competitive. And so being able to deal with that and having your life on the outside, I think translates really well to, to your kind of career moving forward because you're going to have things happen in your life, but you're also going to have work commitments and vice versa. And so it's a more realistic um, experience, I think, uh, than some folks may have otherwise. Completely. Uh, so you're, as you mentioned, you attended uh, St. Uh, FX, St. Francis Xavier University for people who are, are less uh, knowledgeable, which has probably of any university in Canada, arguably the most dedicated uh, alumni. Uh, then the X-Ring is a uh, one of the most recognizable rings uh, in, in the world. Uh, how do you think your experience attending St. FX and in particular attending like a, a smaller liberal arts university in, in, a, in a more rural, uh, small town kind of location impacted your uh, career development? Yeah, it's a great question. I'd say that the main thing that I really took away was the relationships aspect and how important that is uh, with X being a small place. So the school, I, I may have the figures wrong now. It's been It's been a while since I went there, but um, it was about four to 5,000 students. And then the town was only another four or 5,000 people on top of that. So you have a 50, 50 split. And so it's, it's a small community, right? Both in terms of who you're dealing with in school and also just regular folks who live there. And so with that, you have to be pretty respectful and manage your relationships and think about the, the downstream effects that, that it can have of developing or not developing a relationship with folks and how you're going to run into one another. And that's very true in your career as well, right? You never know when you're going to run into someone. It's always about making sure you're putting your best foot forward, making a good first impression because um, you typically don't get a second one uh, if the first one doesn't go well. Um, and then as well, edX, having those small class sizes really allowed you to, to spend time with professors, especially in your upper year. So the first couple of years, like you mentioned, it's a liberal arts school. So you take a general education and lets you basically try a bunch of different areas. I was in the business program or the engineering program and then the business program. Uh, and so I got to try a bunch of different things. Um, and then once I found my calling, so to speak, with there, which ended up being finance, I got to know my professors really well my last couple of years. They're great in terms of being able to provide references, help me go to business school and also helping me with uh, job opportunities. So, yeah. So after St. FX, you uh, uh, received your MBA from uh, Sobe School at, at St. Mary's. Uh, and then after that kind of uh, joined uh, Venture for Canada and in the midst of it also uh, worked at Canadian Tires uh, kind of uh, headquarters. So a few different kind of questions is one is, is how did uh, the experience of um, getting your MBA uh, impact kind of your, your uh, career path? And also what was your experience at Canadian Tire? How did that impact uh, you in terms of the sense of career clarity of what you want, but also what you, you don't want in terms of uh, a career? Yeah, I, I'd say I'd almost answer those in reverse order because I was at Canadian Tire first for a while before going back to school. And even while I was in school, went back to Canadian Tire in, in the summer to do, do an internship. Um, and so I'd say Canadian Tire really helped me understand what my strengths and areas for development were, and also just what I was naturally inclined towards, which was operations. Um, I worked in supply chain logistics um, and international transportation. So basically, how, how does Canadian Tire get all their product from vendors throughout Asia and Europe uh, into North America and ultimately into Canada, um, focused mainly on ocean freight. So it's very much a logistical and analytical type role. And so it helped me really quickly understand which aspects of that I liked and didn't like. And then also as that tied into the marketing and merchandising side of things, which aspects of that side of the business I necessarily liked or didn't like. Um, and with that helped me then identify what I really wanted to get out of business school when I decided to go back, which for me was one, a more generalized like management stream and also to go deeper on kind of the organized organizational behavior side of things to understand how to work with people. Cause I identified pretty early on that I eventually wanted to be in some type of leadership role. I wanted to manage teams um, and understandably in your undergrad, they don't teach you a lot about that because you're just trying to get to that first job. They're teaching you how to have applicable skills in the workplace, as opposed to jumping the queue for five roles and getting to getting to some type of management or leadership position. So that's what I focused on when I went to SME, which has been massively beneficial. Like those type of leadership courses, organizational behavior, um, and just general management um, across a broad variety of areas has been huge. Um, at the time, I really enjoyed it, but you never really know when you're in school how applicable uh, certain things are going to be once you get into the workforce. But um, anytime you're learning about how to how to deal with people, how to manage teams, how to get the best out of your teams, that that's applicable all the time, right? Whether it's in sports, whether it's in work, you name it. So it's been really valuable, and it's been really interesting to see the stuff that I learned at uh, St. Mary's. Um, and how it applies in, in my day-to-day -day work. So 
really thankful for that experience as well. What's some of your key points uh, and recommendations that you have for managers on how to, to lead and motivate the, their teams uh, so that they, that they can be as high performing uh, as possible? Yeah, I'd say two main things for me. Um, one is like obviously set clear expectations, right? You can't expect folks to do what you need them to do and achieve the type of stuff that you want if they're not clear on what that actually is. And so that's setting clear expectations in terms of what the actual outcome is, but then also what's the process to get there. Um, whether that's through goal setting, using OKRs, um, you name it. Um, let the individuals have autonomy if they're um, at a point in their career where that's uh, basically necessary or, or appropriate. Um, but then make sure that they know where they need to get to so that they can then work their way there. Um, that, that's key. And then secondly, I would say um, it's also a healthy reminder, refresher. And I think we all forget this from time to time myself is like, take a situational management or leadership approach to each person on your team. Um, frameworks are fantastic, but they don't work for everybody. Um, they may apply to half your team and, and the other half may need something completely different. So I think you should treat each individual team member um, in their own unique way uh, to try and get the best out of them as an individual, as opposed to try and say, hey, this is the only way I'm going to do things and being too rigid. And it's just, it's unfair for them. And it's ultimately gonna blow up in your face if it doesn't apply for certain individuals. Like each person is super unique and applying one management paradigm or approach uh, to an entire diverse team of you know five, six people is is super challenging. Um, one thing sometimes I find helpful is is when I'm first beginning to work with somebody more closely as a sort of direct report is sometimes have this transparent conversation between two of us of like, what is our communication style? What is what is one of the question I find that's sometimes interesting to ask is, what does trust look like to that person? Because so much of a successful working relationship is all about trust and that kind of understanding that, uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm always amazed to get sometimes trust, what it can look very different to different people in different kind of context. So I think your, your advice is, is spot on. And, and I think it's, uh, it's something that's really important for, for managers uh, to, to consider. So uh, one thing is when, you know, after you graduated from uh, St. Mary's, uh, you worked as the lead of special projects at Presley, which is was a, an early stage a company. It was probably what, uh, 10, 15, 20 people uh, when, when you joined. And you were the lead of uh, special projects at that uh, company. So one thing that I think is interesting is, is to sort of demystify this role of lead of special projects that, or chief of staff that exists in a lot of different startups and kind of uh, companies. So can you describe a little bit about what uh, were some of the, th the, the high level kind of projects or responsibilities that, that you covered in that role? And what advice do you have uh, for somebody who is considering potentially um, going into a chief of staff or lead of special uh, projects uh, type role? Yeah, yeah, sure thing. So it's definitely something that's grown in popularity lately. When I first went into that role, I'd never heard of it. If I'm honest, it was presented to me by the, the CEO and the, and the president of the company of, of this role. And the job description for it, I remember on my offer letter, literally listed out everything. It was like, your responsibilities uh, uh, may include, but are not exclusively like marketing, sales, operations, finance, accounting. Like they just listed everything you could possibly have. Um, and then when I asked them about it, um, what it really was, was a generalist role. Uh, you hear some folks talk about that where it's an early stage company. There's a ton of things that need to get done. And while you need some specialists that are focused in certain areas of engineering um, or maybe sales, which is exactly what we had. We had about, I think, 10 employees when I started, maybe less, mainly technical team, technical co-founding team. The only business folks uh, was we had one person on the kind of account management side, one sales rep, and then um, president, uh, an individual named Todd Finch. Uh, he was kind of a, a do-it-all person. He was an investor in the company as well. And he basically pitched me on the idea of like, hey, I need someone else to help me just get all this stuff done and move the business forward. And this is going to be a great learning experience for you. You're going to get to do a lot of things uh, that you wouldn't otherwise. And instead of taking that kind of straight specialist path of going into marketing or going into finance or what, what have you, um, this way you're going to get an exposure to a broad set of areas. So for me at Presley, that covered everything. I managed people operations, um, our accounting, bookkeeping, um, and finance teams that we outsourced, worked really closely on sales off and, and revenue operations, um, customer success, um, even did sales calls myself, like whatever hole that needed to be filled, I was there. So I remember one day I went and did a presentation to a large big four bank in a suit, and then immediately went back to the office, changed my clothes, and drove to Canadian Tire to buy a barbecue so that we could do a team event the next day. Uh, so it was really an inter interesting and diverse experience for me and uh, was amazing in terms of giving me an idea of what it looks like to run a company 
end to end um, and getting to see that. And I was really fortunate to get that uh, for someone so early, early in their career. I, I agree. I think that those kind of roles, especially at the beginning of one's career, are some of the uh, most strategic ones to pursue because on so many levels. One is, is it, I think, can really enhance someone's sense of career clarity because you get to sort of try it all. You, you try all these different kinds of experiences and you see kind of what you like, what you, what you don't like. Uh, and it also helps you develop a really broad uh, skill set uh, and, and these kind of generalist skills, which are highly transferable across industries, across uh, uh, companies. So uh, super uh, um, interesting to kind of learn more. And, and that anecdote about Canadian Tire and <laughs> that meeting with the right. bank is... <laughs> well, uh, it's ironic. When, when I worked at Canadian Tire, the stat that was circulated around the company was that there, there's a Canadian Tire within a 15-minute drive of like 90% of Canadians and that something like 95 or 99% of Canadians can identify the Canadian Tire logo without any writing on it, like the, the red triangle with the green maple leaf on the top. So it's definitely an institution uh, in Canada. So pretty funny how it comes full circle. I can never fully get away from it. It's a completely an institution, even for non-Canadians who might be listening, C Canadian tire money uh, growing up as, as a kid in the 90s was a big deal. Basically, it's, it's, it was the equivalent of like Canadian tire gift certificates, but they actually printed like their own money and it, it was ubiquitous. I'm not sure, is Canadian tire money still a thing or did they discontinue? It, it is, but they've moved it to a loyalty program. So it's all uh, through an online account now. You can get a card like a credit card, they have an entire financial services uh, aspect of the business now um, where you can get savings accounts, uh, credit cards, financing for certain stuff. So yeah, it's a, it's a little more futuristic than when you and I were growing up. And yeah, it was quite literally money. I can only imagine the amount of paper that was printed um, and potentially wasted on that. I know I still have a giant can of it at my parents' place from when I was a kid. And if I remember correctly, the denominations were like completely off. Like it was like sometimes it was like a thousand dollars to Canadian Tire money equal like ten dollars yeah. of like real money or something. Yeah, the conversion rate I could never figure out. And to this day, I work there and I still don't know how it worked. I'm sure it's more straightforward now being online. Yeah, it was. They they definitely uh, uh, preempted the rise of the gift card because I believe in the '90s gift cards. I think they became a thing in the 2000s. Uh, or I if I remember correctly, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think so. That sounds about right. The uh, so one kind of it, you know, and I know Todd Finch, uh, who you referenced, uh, has you know, played an important role in your career, and it's been kind of like a mentor to you uh, in many ways. What uh, what advice would you give to a recent grad or early kind of career professional in terms of the importance of mentorship, uh, but also how to seek out and, and find and and, and develop uh, mentorship? Uh, style relationships? Yeah, I'd say it's hugely important, but really hard to figure out early on in your career. You, you hear about it, people always talk about like, hey, it's, you should, you can find a mentor. Mentors are important. It's like, well, where, where do I start? It's not like something that you can just go up to someone um, that you don't know and say, hey, I want you to be my mentor. Like some folks do that and it works, but uh, I believe mentorship is a two-way street in that you need to be really interested in having them as a mentor and they also need to be interested in mentoring you. Someone may agree to be your mentor, but if they're not willing to commit and really put the time and effort in and invest in you, then it's not gonna give you uh, what it could. Uh, you're leaving a lot of potential on the table. And so I was really fortunate that you mentioned Todd, uh, who when we talked about the opportunity at Presley, he took an interest in me, um, gave me an opportunity that frankly, like he didn't have to. Um, and then once we were there, I was kind of his guy because he was taking a chance on me. And so he wanted me to do well. And um, he's someone that supported me and gave me access to opportunities and gave me advice. And I'd say the biggest benefit of mentorship for me is getting like honest feedback on what you're doing. Um, when you're in, let's say like a, a manager team member relationship, there's always a level of kind of uh, formality that you need to keep in terms of how someone's doing, because you don't want to blow someone's confidence or overinflate their ego. Whereas with a mentor, they're, they're usually an objective kind of third party to a lot of situations. Obviously, Todd's a little bit different, but we were a small enough company that um, it just gives you that feedback that you don't get otherwise and kind of gives you a sanity check on, on things that you're thinking through. And um, I think it's huge. Now, when it comes to developing a mentor, I'd say first you need to understand what you're looking to get mentored in. Uh, because a lot of folks just see someone that they think is impressive and they're like, I want you to be my mentor. And going back to what we talked about earlier about setting clear expectations is like, well, they don't know what you want to be mentored in. If you don't know what it's in, then how are you ever going to get out of it what you want, right? It's, it's just not clear. And so is it you want career advice? Is it you want specific skill set advice? Um, you name it. But identifying that and then identifying folks that you think could help 
um, is step one. And then from there, it's really about trying to form an, an honest relationship. Um, so making sure that you're, that you're asking for feedback and um, constantly trying to foster that relationship and also giving back as well. Um, it's not fair to just think that you're going to go to someone every time you have problems and they're just basically going to be your therapist and work through it. Um, you need to be able to provide them value. Um, and I think that's where a lot of folks get lost is that they ask someone to mentor them or they want someone to mentor them, but they don't think about what they can give to that person uh, to help with the relationship. Uh, and so that's really key. So whether that's volunteering your time, um, helping them with something, you name it, buy, buying them coffee, um, that type of stuff, uh, it's important. I agree. The reciprocity to, to the point about trust uh, in all, a lot of the research on how trust and relationships are formed, that it's in essence based on reciprocity. If one person does a nice thing for another person, then another person uh, reciprocates. And if there's not that reciprocity in any kind of relationship, uh, as Stephen Covey talks about, the trust bank <laughs> slowly starts to get uh, depleted uh, pretty yeah. uh, quickly. So after you were at, at Presley, you joined the team at uh, Grammarly uh, in a sort of similar role uh, where you were overseeing a diverse range of, of different uh, projects. And since you've joined Grammarly, the uh, company has grown significantly, but even probably when you joined at that point, it was a much larger company than, than, uh, than, than Presley. How did your experience of working in a really early stage uh, or quite early stage kind of company like Presley that was you had 10, 20, 30 people and then going to a, a Grammarly that, that is, is larger. Uh, how did that experience from, a, from and lessons learned from working in that, that smaller kind of environment help you uh, in, a, in a larger organization? Yeah, I'd say comfortability with ambiguity and lack of structure is the biggest thing that I brought over. So when I joined Presley, we were about eight to 10 folks. I was there for just under three years. We grew it at its height to around 40, 45 folks. Um, and then ultimately were acquired by Vision Critical. And then when I moved to Grammarly, it was twice the size. So we were about 80, 90 folks when I joined. Um, and now we're 450 uh, plus, we're over that now. And so it's been uh, a steady trajectory upwards in terms of the headcount that I've been in. And so uh, with any early stage company, there, there's not a lot of structure, right? You, you have structure in terms of what you want to achieve um, as a company and like what your goals are, but how you get there is not always clear. Um, and so being okay with that. And the thing that I tell folks, especially if they're in a generalist role like that or kind of a professional problem solver role, as I like to call it, it's like you need to not only be comfortable with that lack of structure, but also hopefully enjoy it. Because if you're going to work every day and you can get through it, that's one thing. But if you actually get energy from that type of environment and jumping into things and saying like, I don't know what's going to happen today, but we're going to figure it out and I'm going to love it. That's really key. Um, and that's something that to your earlier question around folks that are um, interested in like a chief of staff role, that, that's really important. Like if you want to show up to work today and do the exact same thing, you probably want to go down a specialist route. Um, so that there's some predictability and there's nothing wrong with that. There's a ton of value in that. And you're going to do a lot of great things and have a lot of impact, but a generalist role is fundamentally different. And it applies really broadly, broadly to working at an early stage startup is that everybody is a generalist, whether you're a software engineer, you're working in customer success, you're always going to end up, you hear people say, wear many hats. It's like, yeah, you're going to do a bunch of different stuff because everybody's just working towards one common goal. And you're going to have to do things that you may not want to do, or you may not like, or you may not want to do long-term, but it's necessary to move the business forward. So I'd say that was the biggest thing that I pulled uh, from Presley and then it applied really well at Grammarly, both in terms of my role, the stage of company we're at. And then as we've gone on that growth path now at Grammarly and um, hired a ton of folks and we're still hiring a bunch more, it still applies as we're building out new parts of the business. So I don't think it ever fully goes away. How do you think somebody can enhance their comfortability with uh, ambiguity. And I think particularly during the pandemic where we live in uh, a very uncertain uh, world uh, at, at the moment, that uh, attribute is something that is in increasingly important. It's really important in, in business and, and in particular in, in, in startups. So how do you develop, how do you think somebody develops that, that competency? Yeah, it's a good question. I'd say part of it is always going to be just a personal aspect um, in terms of your values and, and whether or not you're comfortable with it. And it's okay if you're not um, I'd say again, like clear expectations definitely help with it. If you're going into something and you have an upfront kind of self-aware viewpoint that this is going to be uncomfortable, or this is going to be something that I don't know how to figure out, or it could go all over the place. And you take your self-worth away from it and be comfortable with the fact that it could be turbulent or it could be difficult. I think that helps a ton. A lot of folks go in, um, especially when you're coming out of an environment a, as a young uh, kind of new grad in that you're used to a very structured environment in school where it's 
I have a test. It's exactly everything I need to know. And you get a very graded mark on that, which says, you know, X percent of the material and here's what you get. It's very straightforward, A equals B. Um, but then when you go to work, as everybody knows, like it can be all over the place, right? Like just because this is the way that someone has done it and it's best practice doesn't necessarily apply. Um, and so making sure that you can step back before you dive into the problem and realize that this isn't necessarily going to be straightforward and be upfront and honest with yourself about it. I think that helps folks a ton. Um, and then obviously trying it. So if it's something you're unsure about, don't jump into a role where it's a hundred percent that try to ease your way into it. So if you're like a young marketer starting to do a little bit of uh, marketing in an area that you don't necessarily know um, or something that the company needs, but they don't have anyone to do and it's a stretch project for you or kind of a side hustle. Um, that's a great way to test the waters and see how you like working on things that may not be completely in your wheelhouse. Um, and then also understand the joy or lack thereof that you get from accomplishing or not accomplishing that. That's, that's great advice. And I think that the career clarity, especially at someone, it, it's something a lot of people are constantly seeking. And it's something that I think it evolves uh, over time. But, but to your point, the opportunity to sample and try a different things and recognize that it's okay to not like things uh, is, and, and you know, nobody likes every single kind of like job function. Uh, but I think at the beginning of one's career, there's, there's a great opportunity to kind of sample and, and kind of figure out. So now you're the head of uh, revenue operations at, uh, at Grammarly. Um, so in a kind of a sales uh, function uh, of which you mentioned kind of earlier in your career, you had kind of touched on 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 sales and and had done calls and, and worked a little bit in, in sales capacity, uh, and I can imagine you do a lot of hiring uh, or involved in hiring uh, in in your current capacity. What are some of the attributes that you most look for when you're um, hiring uh, potential salespeople or or uh, people in a revenue generating function to to join your your team? Yeah, I'd say. For sales, well, for everybody, for instance, at Grammarly, um, you'll see on our website, we have our values that we look for in everybody that we hire. So the acronym spells out eager, but it's basically ethical, adaptable, pretty, empathetic, and remarkable. And those are the main traits that we feel as a company um, set anyone up for success and will make them a great fit at Grammarly. So that's something we look for for everybody. Now, depending on the role that you're hiring in and also the stage of which that role is entering in the company, um, there are some things that I would say I look for to spike more than others. So if you're like, hiring someone in a massive company as a software engineer in a very structured environment, like, yeah, you need to make sure that they're very comfortable in that environment and that they like those set expectations. But then for us uh, in particular, right now, hiring with uh, our Grammarly business team, which is our team's based product that's relatively new, there's a lot of change. It's like really hyper growth um, and more of a startup within a larger company. And so with that, on the adaptability side of what we talked about earlier, that's really important. Um, adaptability and also grit around being a self-starter and that um, not everything is going to be laid out for you. So um, one example that I like to give, especially with sales reps, is like if you're an early stage company and you want to hire a really seasoned AE from, let's say, Salesforce or Oracle that's been in the game for 25 years, always in that massive uh, kind of big box environment, they may not be your best hire, right? They're used to having a ton of support when it comes to resources, content, enablement, brand recognition. It's much more straightforward of they're taking something that is known and commoditized and making it work for a particular customer, as opposed to convincing someone why your product as an early stage company would work for them or why they could actually remove something like a Salesforce or an Oracle and take on a piece of software that you're using. That's a fundamentally different sale, right? Um, they just don't translate. So I think a lot of folks can sometimes get caught up in where, where someone's gone to school or where they worked um, in terms of the brand recognition. But in actual fact, you should think about like the values, talents, skills, and knowledge that you're looking for in a particular role. Like, again, and I feel like a broken record, but like setting clear expectations that, that that's the exact same internally when you're hiring. You can't hire someone unless you know exactly what the ideal person looks like um, in terms of those traits that I mentioned. And so taking the time and effort and putting that investment in upfront to document what that is, makes it a lot simpler when you actually start the interview process Say, hey, this person spikes on X, Y, and Z that we mentioned. They may be missing this. We're okay with that. We can still bring them in. That's a coachable area. Um, or vice versa, they're just they're just not a fit at all. Um, but having that clear alignment across the team and kind of a clear profile for any role, whether it's sales, revenue operations, marketing, software engineering, you name it, something we focus on every time we open a role, we have a full workbook that you have to put together. Um, I know in the past, we've, we've talked a little bit about the top grading uh, interview kind of technique. Uh, can you describe that a little bit to our, our listeners and, and what are some of the, the positives of that approach when um, assessing uh, candidates for, for a role? 
Yeah, yeah. So it's basically about understanding a holistic picture of that individual in terms of their previous behaviors and understanding uh, whether or not that best fits into um, our environment so that we can set them up for success, right? So when you're assessing someone, again, it's really easy to strictly hire on potential, which is great, but you all obviously need to um, balance that out as well with previous behaviors. So what does that look like? So understanding what they've done in the past, the relationship with their manager, um, how they've enjoyed or not enjoyed certain aspects of their role, and then tying that back to the profile that I mentioned, that's, that's really important. So that's something that we take the time to do, um, as opposed to um, what a lot of folks can do from time to time, which is focused on basically what is their role fit? Like, do they have the skills necessary to do the job? There's tons of people in the world that do, but if they don't fit in the environment and the culture that you as a company are trying to foster, and hopefully are ultimately like raising that and adding to it, then they may not be your best hire. And um, misfiring on hiring is like, the most expensive thing you can do as a business because it takes forever for you to find out whether or not, and by forever, I mean months or years, um, and the amount of time, money, um, and effort that you basically put into starting the hiring process, hiring someone, onboarding them, leveling them, coaching them, managing them, you can never get that back. Um, it's not like you can just change a portion of your product and maybe make up that revenue um, on the long term. Like it, it's really, really impactful and really expensive. It's interesting over the years I've uh, probably seen hundreds of different entrepreneurs speak to Venture for Canada fellows. And uh, a common question is we're asking uh, entrepreneurs what their biggest mistake is. And probably half the time, their biggest mistake that they'll say is something hiring related, uh, hiring, you know, the wrong. And likewise, they'll often say some of the, particularly if they're successful, some of the, the greatest uh, victories they've ever had are the people that they did hire. Yep. It's, it's a super, uh, it's a super high, it's probably one of the hardest things I think to, to do in, in, in leadership is, is finding the, the right people. And I love the kind of top grading uh, technique. Uh, I also, I, I resonated a lot with what you're talking about where people will sometimes get obsessed with the brands of where somebody like worked at. So to your point of somebody, oh, they worked at Facebook or they worked at McKinsey or they worked at these different places. And th those things are just so superficial, it, 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 including where you know, somebody went to school. What matters more is what they've done, what's their character. And, uh, and, you know, what's their uh, potential to, to add value f uh, within the context of the environment that, that they'd be working in, not necessarily like where they went to school. <laughs> so um, yeah. I think that it's great, great advice. So on the, the topic of uh, kind of revenue generating, one, one area that I've noticed Venture for Canada fellows have increasingly been uh, getting hired on uh, is in roles related to like sales enablement. And that this is a term that has become significantly more uh, well used amongst startup as, and uh, technology companies, it seems like in the last kind of like three years. So can you describe uh, to our listeners what, it, what exactly um, is sales enablement? And uh, more granularly, like what, does it, what do sales enablement related roles within a company uh, look like? Yeah, sure thing. So at a high level, it's basically a cross-functional focus on optimizing your sales results via constant improvement in resources. Um, and so it can mean a bunch of different things and it'll mean different things at different companies. Um, but the, the high-level buckets are based around kind of positioning and messaging, content creation, tools, coaching, upskilling. And then one that I like to throw in that you don't see in a lot of places is actually automation. If you can make it so that someone is able to do something faster without ever having to deal with another human or look something up, that in my mind is like ideal and it's also very cost effective. Um, and so a lot of folks that you see come in um, are focused on one particular area. So maybe they're sales and but they're focused on the product marketing side. So they're really heavily deep into the positioning and messaging of your product um, and coaching the team and creating them with resources, scripts, uh, gold decks or demo pitch decks pretty much. Um, that, that allow them to do it. Other folks like on my team are focused really heavily on insights and improving through that. So identifying what our ideal customer looks like. Uh, where do we have the highest close rates uh, when it comes to the industry or the team size uh, or the uh, geography that we're selling to so that you can basically identify those nuggets of where you're most successful as a business and help you hone in um, on that area as opposed to just spraying from the hip um, at everything. And so folks can have a broad variety of roles within it. Um, a lot of times it's marketing focused. Um, and then there's a bunch of different areas that you can jump into as well. Um, in general, it's just so key, right? Um, sales enablement ensures that you're consistently up leveling your org's ability to position yourself to win deals, uh, which is huge. It's the lifeblood of a company. Um, and enablement really allows reps as well to be prepared 
as they go into a sales cycle and not have to worry about anything except the customer that's in front of them and providing the best experience possible and increasing that likelihood that they do close the deal, which is in your best interest. Yeah, I can imagine effective sales enablement can, in essence, be a supercharger of, of growth in the company. It, it catalyzes, you know, all the activities of, of the sales team and makes uh, the team uh, that much more effective. So one thing you mentioned earlier is that you, you know, joined Grammarly when it was 80, 90 people. You're now approaching uh, 500 people. That's a lot of growth in, in, a, in a couple of years. And one of the things I've always found fascinating is how companies uh, create a culture of alignment. Uh, particularly amongst their, their employees, particularly when they've grown uh, quite quickly over a short uh, period of, uh, of time. So uh, how have you um, seen that uh, been done at, at Grammarly? Uh, and what advice do you have uh, for companies that let's say are at that 50, 60 person level, but are poised to, to grow in, in, you know, by hundreds of employees a year for, for the next couple of years? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and obviously it differs depending on your company size, but in general, the, the things that I've seen that have been really successful at Grammarly and elsewhere is setting really, again, clear expectations from a top-down perspective in terms of here's where we want to take the business, here's the objective, and then also here are the key results that we know will indicate that we've done that. And then allowing departments, teams, and individuals cascade from that so that at the end of the day, whether I'm a new grad employee or I'm a VP of a particular function, what I'm working on and what my team are working on, there's a clear line from what I'm doing to how it contributes to that top level goal. Um, and so that's a mixture of both setting clear expectations, having transparency and the nuts and bolts of like actually having it available. It's one thing to tell people. And a lot of times folks will look at that as transparency, but if you can have it documented somewhere so that someone can reference and even better, if you can then have that cascading effect that I named uh, just a little bit ago, actually visible so that you can see it physically, um, that helps a ton. Um, and then also you need to update on that goal as well. You can't just start the year and say, hey, we want to grow sales 300% and then not talk about it till like the 11th hour of month 11. And all of a sudden it's like, hey, we didn't get there. <laughs> Why not, right? It's an iterative process. So don't just set it and forget it. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. And I think particularly in very entrepreneurial, highly uncertain environments, the goals shift a lot. And that, yeah. you know, it's, uh, you can have a goal and then three months later you can drop things or you can, uh, uh, you know, change uh, whole strategies. So it's, it's not to be too necessarily beholden uh, to specific goals, although goals are important. And, and to your point about clarity, it's really important to think have them as an organization, but um, to, to, to be kind of adaptable uh, along the journey. So one, uh, my kind of second last question uh, for you, Josh, is um, if you could go back uh, in time uh, and uh, give advice uh, to you, uh, your 22 year old uh, self, what would you say and why? It's a deep question, Scott. Um, I would have to say, probably go back to my 22 year old self, think about the mindset I was in, tell myself to slow down, listen more, and be more thoughtful about my future. Um, I know, at least speaking from my perspective, I was so eager to get going. You've kind of built up your whole life to. to getting to a certain point and then all of a sudden you're a full-blown adult and you don't actually know what that means, um, but you're just so eager to, to get it started that you don't necessarily take stock of what you wanna do or why you wanna do it. You know that you wanna get out there and start doing things and there's lots of folks around you that are getting jobs or going to grad school or going traveling and you're just like, I just need to be doing something. Um, but at the end of the day, like there, there's no rush. You have your whole life ahead of you and also what, what you do at that age isn't necessarily going to dictate what you're doing for the rest of your life. Like if you'd see me at 22, I was a finance grad. I was thought I'd be working on Bay street or wall street. I had that whole kind of mindset going. And then once I got into it, um, realized that that wasn't really what I wanted to do. And now look at me, I'm working in tech, uh, on the West coast. So like, I never would have thought that's possible. Um, but being more open to opportunities and thinking about what I want to do, as opposed to what's the title or the role of the company I want to be in, um, think that would have saved me a lot of anxiety at that age and helped me focus uh, better on, on what opportunities to, to pursue. That being said, it worked out. I'm happy with what I'm doing. And that's the other thing to keep in mind for everybody of, yeah, think more about your future, but like, it's going to work out. Be a good person, work hard and everything will be fine. As the guest in the inaugural episode of Adventure Canada podcast uh, said, 
uh, Kiki Athanas, uh, embrace the journey and not uh, the outcome. And I think that that is a good uh, um, uh, advice relevant to, to what you're saying as, as well. On uh, the note of uh, advice uh, for our listeners, what are two or three books uh, that you recommend uh, people check out uh, and why? Okay. I'd have to say, if I broke it down in a couple different areas, like the most recent book that I read that I'd recommend, just because it's off of mine, is The Promised Land by Barack Obama. I feel like everybody's heard of it with the book tours um, and the notoriety that he has, but it was just a fascinating look into his political journey. And I really enjoyed uh, also getting a view into like his leadership style like life advice, it has a really good mix of applicable things for, for your personal life and your professional life. And just really fascinating. It's really long. Uh, first volume of the books, almost 800 pages. And there's another one coming out that's a similar size. So it's a commitment to sit down and get through it. But uh, I really liked it. Um, if I had to pick something more on the professional realm in terms of like a business book, uh, I feel like it's broadly popular, but Chew Dog by Phil Knight is one that I actually just reread for the third time because I enjoyed it so much. And for me, Everyone thinks of Nike as this massive, like multi-billion dollar behemoth, but the truth is that they struggle for more than a decade to even stay alive. Like the, and that's what's awesome about that book is that he focuses on those early years. And it gives you a really true appreciation for the grind that it can be and how you really need a, a, a mixture of both like that grit, but also luck to be successful and the like timing has to be right. And so I think it's just like a healthy reminder that like, it's not a quick shoot to the top. Like you're going to fail more often than you're going to succeed. So that was really cool. And then hey, if I had to pick my all-time favorite book, it'd be a book called Barbarian Days by William Finnegan. Um, it has nothing to do with business. I think it won a Pulitzer Prize for best uh, autobiography or memoir in like 2014 when it came out. It's a fantastic read about his very interesting life. He's a writer for uh, The New Yorker and he used to do uh, war reporting and worked in Australia and um, Africa and the Middle East and is really into surfing. So it's just like a very fascinating human being that walks you through his life. And I really connected with it when I read it back uh, when it came out. I need to purchase Barbarian Days. I have, I've heard that I've, uh, I'm going to add it to my, my book uh, to purchase list because I've, I've heard that book recommended before and it's excellent. I've read the other uh, two ones, uh, A Promised Land uh, by uh, President Obama is a fantastic book. And I agree, a ton of interesting insights uh, into his uh, leadership style. And it's fascinating in the book, his just, he, I, well, I think he's one of the rare politicians that is actually uh, self-reflective and is actually a talented writer. Yeah, he, like he would probably be a writer if he, if he wasn't a politician. I mean, he was a writer. He published a book before he was ever famous. Uh, so, you know, I think it's a testament to, to that. But some of the observations in the book, like even when he describes uh, Rahul Gandhi, who uh, uh, in essence ran India, and he just describes him as like the scion, like basically this entitled scion of like uh, the this Gandhi political and uh, as having the air of just like somebody who didn't really care of being a world leader. Or the description of Putin as somebody who isn't used to anybody ever challenging him. Like there's some little turns of phrase that I think are is is pretty remarkable, and it's a it's an amazing. Uh, book and I also second Shoe Dog. It's it's a really 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 fantastic read and and to your point about grit, like it's amazing how many times Nike almost went bankrupt. Like the, the and that they're uh, the somewhat Byzantine descriptions of the Japanese trading houses and the role of financing and trade financing and and how you know they're at uh, they almost got destroyed <laughs> multiple times. The, those are the the uh, first two books which I which I have read. Uh, they're definitely fantastic uh, recommendations. I, I highly enjoyed them as well. Yeah, they're great. It's it's amazing how, how many times he ends a chapter or starts a chapter with "I went home stressed, not knowing if the business was going to survive." It's uh it's pretty funny. And now it's this like, you know, I, obviously one of the most uh, iconic uh, brands uh, in, in the world. So you're pretty yeah. impressive. Um, it, it has been a pleasure having you on A New Wave of Entrepreneurship, Josh. We've covered a lot of different uh, topics. I would say if there was one theme, it was the importance of clarity. I think personal clarity, organizational clarity, uh, and ultimately organizations and startups that have a sense of clarity amongst employees, amongst team members, uh, when hiring people, that you're ultimately setting yourself and individuals up for success, the more clarity uh, that, that there is. And also a ton of interesting lessons on everything from sales enablement uh, to um, the impact that sports can have on somebody's personal development to on a little more lighthearted note, Canadian tire money <laughs> and a wide variety of different things. 
Uh, and just in general, it's been a pleasure um, continuing to get to know you over the last uh, six years. We've known each other for a long time, but over the last six years, uh, it's, it's been a pleasure um, uh, seeing the continued growth of your career and trajectory. And it's going to be super exciting to see where you continue to go, Josh. Um, thanks so much for coming on uh, the podcast today. No problem at all, Scott. It was an absolute pleasure. Likewise, I um, appreciate you taking the time. And it's definitely a fun journey around a bunch of different topics I didn't know we'd cover. So it was great. That's it for this week's episode of A New Wave of Entrepreneurship. Stay connected with us via our social and our email list. Subscribe in your favorite podcast app so that you don't miss our next episode. If you have feedback on today's episode, tweet us at Venture for Canada. That is Venture, the number four, Canada. Or email us at podcast at Venture for, that's spelled F-O-R, Canada.ca. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. I'm Scott Sturr, and until next time, stay safe, stay motivated, and stay grateful. A New Wave of Entrepreneurship is produced by Juanita Lee Garcia and Latifa Farah. Editing and mixing also done by Latifa Farah. Erica Ormiston is our editorial assistant. Mark Wallach and Premium Beat own the copyright and publishing rights related to the song used in this podcast. The comments and opinions, recommendations, or suggestions expressed on the podcast by the guests are not liable to Venture for Canada and belong solely to each individual. Any information provided stated by our guests and our host is independent of Venture for Canada. A new wave of entrepreneurship is a Venture for Canada brand and all content is owned by Venture for Canada. If you'd like to use our content, please reach out to us at podcast at venture4, that's spelled F-O-R, Canada.ca.